interested in some discussion anyway. I, I was going to try to live stream this, but internet is not strong enough to do all of all of this all together. So we'll go with this. Uh, yeah, so we're starting Axe. We're beginning our look at Axe. It's going to take us right to Advent or so. I, I should know better than to plan uh, in these days. Uh, plan so far ahead, but that's that's what we're doing. Uh, March through the Book of Acts. Uh, today we're looking at Acts one one to eleven. It's a sermon text. If you have already watched church or, or done church together, uh, that's what we're going to be looking at uh, in worship this morning. Uh, we're maybe we'll we'll actually read that just to start our time together. Uh, this morning for Bible study, we'll read that and then launch into all that I have to say. <laughs> There'll be a lot of me talking again today. I apologize for that in advance, but uh, feel free to jump in whenever you have a comment or a question or, or want some more dialogue about whatever I'm talking about. All right, so I'll pray and then maybe one or two of you want to read Acts 1, 1 to 11, and then we'll get into our overview of the book of Acts. Well, let's pray. God, we thank you for this time together that, as we've said for weeks and weeks now, even though we can't be together physically, that we still can be together, gathered around your word, gathered around who you are. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be in our midst, uh, just as as we'll see you working through the book of Acts throughout the whole world. We We know that you still are moving and stirring, that you still bring a uh, Jesus to to light and to life. We pray that you would do that in our Bible study and our time together today, that you would guide our, our discussion, that you would uh, focus our thoughts, our attention on you. So we pray that you would be honored and glorified in all things for Jesus, especially in this time. Amen. So if somebody wants to read for us, uh, Acts 1, 1 to 11. And then we'll jump in. That, that helps provide a good overview of the entire book, I think. Since I said this is going to be recorded, nobody wants to speak at all, right? <laughs> in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself <coughs> to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thanks, uh, Larry and Marion, for being the brave ones to read this morning. I uh, so yeah, we'll like I said, we'll think on that uh, for our, our worship time and, and in the sermon there, just a brief uh, 
time looking at that, the ascension, uh, to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, his physical presence on the earth. Uh, he gathers his disciples to the mountain. He's taken up uh, from their sight, and then they're kind of left standing around. What do we do now? And that's the the segue, the lead uh, from from the Gospels into Acts and into the, really the rest of the New Testament. Uh, Acts chronicling uh, the growth of the the new church, the young church, uh, the disciples going out and uh, doing all that Jesus had called them to. And so we will let's see here. I'm trying. I don't know. Do you see the PowerPoint there on the screen now? You do? Okay, good. It's worked. I, yeah, so we're calling this uh, series this look at Acts sent as witnesses because really that's the, the heart of the book is, is this idea of the disciples going as witnesses and, and bearing witness to all that Jesus had, had done, all that he had taught, uh, who he is, bearing witness to uh, the, the crucifixion and to the resurrection. Uh, if you've read through the book of Acts uh, recently or would be a good time to do that uh, whenever lounge in the sun this afternoon outside and you can read through the book of Acts uh, you'll see that that's the, the, the constant pattern the constant uh, uh, aim trajectory of the book is uh, sharing uh, the, the gospel of Jesus and so we'll we'll dig into that a little bit more together uh, but we'll unpack some just some basic preliminary stuff. I like this. I don't know if this is helpful. We do this whenever we start a book. I don't know if it's helpful for you guys, but it's good for me just to get my my bearing, my footing where we're at and what we're talking about, what we're dealing with in books. Uh, we'll provide some background information and then get into some, some more uh, looking at the themes, some of the highlights of the book, that sort of thing. Uh, Author, always good to know who wrote the book. Uh, Luke is the author. Uh, we see that right at the very beginning. He doesn't name himself directly. Uh, verse 1, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until that day he was taken up into heaven. Uh, yeah, so not named directly, but clearly this is a sequel to a book that was already written. And if you were to flip over to Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 3, you would see that the beginning of Luke's gospel, that Luke attributes his gospel to uh, Theophilus. He says, I, I don't have it memorized. If somebody's there, if they want to read Luke 1, verse 3, unless I get there first. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seems good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Yeah, so that's Luke's introduction to his gospel, saying that he's he's undertaken a, a careful uh, uh, examination, uh, that he's borne witness to all that he's going to write about, the, uh, the life, the ministry, the, the teaching of Jesus, all that's happened to Jesus, and that he's writing it to, to Theophilus. So, yeah, this, this guy named Theophilus. Uh, who in Greek, his name means friend of God. Theophilus means friend of God. Uh, not much really is known about this Theophilus. It's thought that he might be a patron. Uh, back in the day, uh, often uh, people had supporters, had backers. Uh, it's actually a growing thing again. If you watch YouTube or anything like that, some of these like YouTube uh, guys that are trying to get started, you know, making money, making a living on uh, just making videos about their lives or whatever they're doing. Uh, they subscribe to a, a service called Patreon, where people can give money directly to them to help support their work and, and what they're doing. Uh, so, yeah, this idea of, of Theophilus might be someone fairly wealthy that was helping to finance or support Luke's work, either as a doctor or in his uh, ministry following Jesus. I uh, yeah, so this sense of, of Theophilus coming alongside, supporting the, the work of, of Luke. Uh, and again, just his name, friend of God, uh, it, you know, can be, be attributed. I, you know, while Luke wrote the gospel to Theophilus, this one person in particular, I think his name also, uh, you know, helps expand the horizon a little bit. To, 
I, you know, this sense of Luke's writing to all the friends of God, all those who call themselves a, a friend, a, a follower of Jesus. I, yeah, so author uh, Luke wrote it, a doctor, I, and you'll probably see some similarities if you were to, to compare Luke and Acts, uh, just the amount of details and, uh, I, you know, is, is pretty unique in all of the New Testament. I, you know, some of the, the times, the dates, some of that, that stuff that sometimes gets kind of glossed over in other places, uh, you know, by other people. Luke is attentive to those, those details, to those facts. And feel free to jump in or stop me if you have questions or want anything to, to discuss. Nobody's going to be bold enough to unmute, but... Uh, Put your hand up or something or whatever you want to do. I more than willing to stop and talk more. Uh, date when it was written. There's some question about this. Uh, I see likely it's in the the 60s AD. That follows fairly closely. Most of the Gospels were likely written uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 AD. Uh, you know, a little bit after Jesus' crucifixion, which probably took place at 33. AD, so there's a, a little bit of time uh, that had evolved and, and I, you know, gone through here. Uh, so it, it makes sense that Acts, you know, this is already we've heard it's a sequel to the book of Luke. So it makes sense that it has to be written after the book of Luke. Uh, some people would say that it's written much later in the 80s or 90s uh, or even 100. Uh, and they point to the fact uh, either of these dates actually in the 60s or much later uh, both sides would argue uh, for their position in the fact that uh, Luke doesn't make mention of of the temple of the destruction of the temple he doesn't have kind of a negative uh, uh, viewpoint on the Roman authorities uh, you know coming in in AD 70 is when the temple was destroyed and in Jerusalem was kind of thrown into upheaval at that point uh, so because there's no mention of this monumental, this important event in the life of, of Israel and the life of God's people there, uh, the temple being the place where they worship God, where they had to offer sacrifice and everything else, because there was no mention of that. It's either before the temple or significantly after that. It's already old news and people, you know, already knew about it or, uh, you know, it had, it had moved on to, to other things. But I, I tend to think it's earlier. It kind of makes sense. You're writing a book. There's more to say. You know, how, how do you follow up what I've already written about, what I've already told you? I, yeah. He didn't quite get to the trilogy. That seems to be the good movie plots and everything. But uh, yeah, two books there, I, which is enough. Uh, between Luke and Acts, it's, it's almost a quarter of the content of the New Testament uh, you know, there. Uh, so it's a, a sizable chunk. Uh, yeah, for lots of information there. The reason for writing is uh, always helpful too to be thinking about why why somebody's writing, uh, the purpose behind that. Kind of simple. Uh, you could have guessed it already. Uh, simply to to tell the spread of the gospel. It uh, chronicles the spread of the gospel and centering around verse eight that we read just a little while ago it says uh, jesus words as he had gathered his disciples on the mountain just before he ascended he says that you will receive power when the holy spirit has come on you and you, you will be my witnesses in jerusalem in judea samaria and to the ends of the earth and so chronicling this spread of the gospel that's actually why i chose that picture you see that in the background for that you know that drop in those the water uh, it starts in one place and, and ripples out and moves out. You've all seen that enough. I, I see it displayed behind me there on the whiteboard. That's why I came into the office. I don't have this stuff at home. So, <laughs> but uh, you know, the sense that it starts in Jerusalem in, in the center and and moves outward, uh, you know, from that place. Uh, so there's a geographic spread of the gospel from the center of of Christianity, the center of, of uh, Jewish faith and religion there in Jerusalem. There's a spread from, from that one place, uh, continuing to spread outward. Uh, Judea, you know, encompasses slightly larger area. You might say like the Southwest region or, uh, you know, of Saskatchewan. 
uh, Samaria expands out a little bit further and then to the ends of the earth. Uh, so there's a geographic spread of the gospel, but what, what we also see as, as Acts progresses is that there's an ethnic spread as well, that at the beginning, uh, it's the, the focus on sharing the gospel of Jesus, who Jesus is, what he's done, has been, you know, is focused on the Jewish people, uh, people that already have faith in God. But as, uh, you know, the book progresses, uh, Peter famously has a vision of, of things being clean and unclean and, uh, you know, his, he, he being one of the very first to start pushing for uh, the inclusion of the Gentiles. And then later, uh, of course, Paul takes that on. The second half of the book of Acts really focuses in on the spread of the, the gospel to the Gentiles. And Gentiles just meaning everybody who's not a Jewish person. Uh, sometimes that's used uh, in a negative sense, you know, people that are opposed to uh, the gospel or opposed to uh, faith or religion, but uh, in this most broad sense, just anybody who's not, a, not an Israelite, not, not from the Jewish origin there. And so the geographic spread uh, from, from one place to around the world, uh, ethnically, it's not spread. It's not just for one group of people or one small uh, enclave, but it's for all people. And, and we'll see that already next week with, with Pentecost and how there is already a spread uh, going out and inclusion of, of multiple languages, multiple people groups uh, in, in the message of the gospel. And I think that's consistent with, with the gospels, what Jesus himself uh, you know, said, uh, Matthew 24, uh, verse 14, uh, Jesus is talking about the signs of the end of the age and you know, he says in that verse that the gospel has to be preached to the whole world, to all the nations, to all peoples, and then the end of the age will come, then the age will end, uh, and Jesus will return. So that, that sense of urgency with spreading the gospel and all people having to hear, having to know, and all people being included in the promises of God, not just those that thought they should be included, uh, but, but the whole world being included in that. Then finally, characters, who's, who are we looking at in this book? Uh, it's been said, uh, it shouldn't be called the Acts of the Apostles necessarily, but the Acts of, of the Holy Spirit, the Acts of Jesus. Uh, some of your books, uh, yeah, my Bible just says Acts, but lots of them say the Acts of the Apostles. It's, the, it's kind of the older, older way of, of talking about Acts. Uh, but I think the Holy Spirit really is the primary character, the, the work of Jesus, Jesus' uh, presence in, in, on the earth. Uh, he's uh, the prime mover, the, the initiator of, of all things. There's a sense of, of Paul, uh, especially later on, uh, multiple times, waiting until the Spirit moves him to go and do something, or the sense the Spirit's leading, and then he goes. I, so, so really the Holy Spirit, the power of Jesus, the power of the, the risen Jesus is the primary uh, character here, uh, working through people, just as he does still today, working through kind of everyday ordinary people. It starts with the disciples initially, but we see this spread as well as, as the gospel, as the message you know, goes out from Jerusalem. There's more and more people involved uh, brought into the story. Uh, Peter is the the primary person uh, that Acts follows through the first half of the book. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, is mentioned quite a bit. He tags along with Peter and, and with others uh, throughout the book. And then the second half of Acts follows the story of Saul, his conversion, and uh, he's later known as Paul. Uh, much of the book of Acts it follows Paul and his, his journeys, his missionary trip there. Everyone following still okay or questions or I never know if I'm going too too quick or providing too much or <laughs> if this is good or what. But uh, just a sense of kind of helping us ground ourselves or get a sense of footing uh, where we're at, what we're dealing with. Uh, especially since Acts is, is kind of a big book, uh, kind of meandering, it's, it's hard. That's one of the things I struggled with, and I'm still not entirely sure that we'll go through the entire book uh, just straight through, because uh, it's kind of hard just to read straight through. 
uh, kind of meandering and we'll touch on some of the difficulties with reading acts uh, a little bit later. But a brief broad overview, any questions on that? We're good to, anything you'd add for a purpose maybe or? So the entire book, is that what's the timeline in that, John Mark? Is it like just all within a year or is it over a course of several years? Well, it'd be over a course of, of several years. Like, you know, the content that's being written about, is that what you mean? Or uh, how long it took him to write? What do you, because the material he's covering is over over quite a few years as and we'll see that, especially as we get into the, uh, the, the journeys that Paul takes. Uh, it's pretty easy to start pinpointing dates and, and uh, you know, following him along through his uh, journeys by boat, especially. So yeah, over over a number of years that he, he writes about anyway. I'd have yeah, to do some digging not... to... Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, doesn't it, like as you go through acts, does it not correlate to some of the uh, writings, like to um, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians? Yeah, they most kind of. of I'm right. Yep. Yeah, most of Acts. It's pretty easy to again with Paul's writings, especially in Paul's travels and journeys. It's pretty easy to uh, pinpoint. Uh, Acts highlights five different trips to Jerusalem. I. Uh, in, in some sort of various form that Paul takes. Uh, there's only three mentioned later in Paul's writings, but uh, yeah, as as we journey through through Acts, we'll, we'll see some of the parallels there or, or some of the points of contact that this is where Paul would have written Galatians, or this is this is where Paul wrote Ephesians or, uh, you know, following through with that. So I don't have that right in front of me where we're all the timelines, I forget, uh, you know, how that's spread out, but you can do some digging there. So it's over over a, a fair period of time. I forget the missionary journeys, uh, you know, that Paul takes, but uh, again, fairly easy to, to track down. I always seem to leave you with Homer Grandy and then you never follow up with me on what you've discovered, but. <laughs> So what would it be possibly be most of the the thirty years you know from the crucifixion until uh, until uh, it's probably was written? Yeah, it very well could be uh, because we see right from the very beginning, right? You know, this is this is forty days after the the resurrection is when Acts picks up. Uh, we're pretty clear on on that date, and then yeah. Uh, Paul's journeys occur sometime in the 60s to you know 70s AD. If you flip through and, and follow through uh, some of his writings, it's, it's usually right around 60 AD and, and a little bit following. So, uh, which kind of corresponds with uh, Luke's timeline of writing Acts. You know that this is still fresh. This is still kind of unfolding, uh, as, especially as he gets later on in, into Paul's journeys. Uh, you know, Paul gets to Jerusalem, and that's kind of the end of, of Acts, uh, Acts 28 there. Uh, Paul finally makes it to Jerusalem. So, uh, yeah, unpacking those 30 years between the ascension and Paul finally making it to Jerusalem for the, you know, for the last time there. Alrighty. Yeah, so just visually helpful, and this sums up a little bit of what we were just talking about here. Uh, some ways that you could break down acts or, or think about it. Uh, the most simple way would be uh, just, just about in half. Uh, the top section, the top three boxes that you see there, uh, follow the early church and Peter primarily. Uh, acts 1, one to, uh, Acts 1 uh, to Acts 12. Uh, follows Peter, and then the second half of the book, uh, Acts 12 to Acts 28, uh, follows primarily Paul and his journeys, his uh, trips and travels that way. Uh, 
but I broke it up kind of more in these uh, six sections, a little bit smaller. I, it's not arbitrary just uh, picking, <laughs> picking a, a verse and seeing where it lands or anything. Uh, there's a reason behind this uh, because each of these sections end with a very uh, a similar phrase, a similar uh, thing is said really to wrap up each of these parts. So if you were to look over at Acts 6 verse 7, you'll see the first demonstration of, of, of kind of Luke's summary or wrap up of, of this first section. It says the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So we won't do this right now. I'll leave that as homework maybe for you to do if you really are interested. But you can look at the, the last verse of each of these other sections, and you'll see that there's a similar phrasing, this, this idea of, of the word of God spreading, the word of God increasing, and disciples multiplying. There's in, in most of those six sections, both of those elements are there. In one or two, it just talks about the, the disciples multiplying in number, multiplying greatly. Uh, so it kind of seems to be uh, Luke's way of indicating a break in, in the content here. You know, I'm talking, first of all, about the church in Jerusalem. These first six chapters, we're going to see how the church grew in that city. And then he uses that phrase, the word of God increased, the disciples multiplied, uh, to indicate, I'm done talking about, Jerusalem, we're going to move on to the spread of the gospel to the church a little bit further afield in, to Judea and Samaria. I'm done talking about them. We're going to talk about the inclusion of, of all of the Gentiles, all of those outside of the faith, uh, the Jewish faith there. I can make this uh, PowerPoint available too, so you don't have to scramble writing. Sorry, some of you I see are doing that. I can make that available so you have this uh, information too. I, so, yeah, like I said, we're probably just going to plow through Acts. That's my best guess at this point, my uh, best spread, spreadsheet that I have laid out. Uh, we're just going to plow through. Uh, pay, we won't pay too much attention you know, to, to the, the particulars of the sections, other than the fact that they indicate the gospel uh, spreading going further afield. You know, that's the, the one thing to, to continually take note, that it's, it's continually moving forward, continually advancing and expanding, uh, you know, in each section, uh, year to year, and and uh, you know, so on and so forth. There. Any questions on that? It's kind of a brief, brief overview. It's, uh, yeah, like I said, we're not going to get too much into detail until we get into some of these uh, you know, sections in a little bit closer. We can look at at some particular passages, but Acts is such a big book, uh, covers uh, such a long time and, and so much so much material. Uh, helpful maybe just having a few different uh, places to hang your hat or, or pay attention to, uh, oh, this is talking about, you know, this section or this, this period of time or, or whatever there, so. Any comments? We'll look at some themes here, some of the, the key words. I always like to do this, you know, the, the repeated words, the important phrases, uh, the important things to be paying attention to in, in books. Uh, this helps to uh, fill in and, and highlight uh, the overall theme, the overall purpose of the book. Uh, but also draws in some of the, the finer details, you know, what, what Luke really is getting at here in Acts, what he wants us to pay attention to. And, and some of that changes uh, you know, in each section as, as the gospel spreads and uh, you know, different people are, are being involved in the spread of the gospel. Uh, you know, some of these themes kind of shift and change a little bit, but these are, are some of the overarching uh, you know, throughout the book uh, things that we'll see. First one uh, is a focus on the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, uh, specifically that, that uh, that's idea of the power and the authority that rule the reign of Jesus on the earth, that even though he's not physically present on the earth anymore, that he still rules from the right hand of God uh, and, and his, his spirit 
that he's given to his disciples is his, his very power, the power for life and witness, uh, the power for, for ministry, uh, that Jesus still rules and reigns. And the kingdom of God, it's, that phrase itself is only used, like you see there on the screen, eight times in Acts. So it's not, not a huge, uh, you know, oftentimes I say look for repeated words and sometimes you'll get a word repeated eight times in like eight verses. Uh, you know, so to have eight, eight times the kingdom of God mentioned it over 28 chapters may seem kind of insignificant, but uh, it's, it's very significant. And, and we see that just in the fact that it's at the very beginning of the book. We hear this phrase, the kingdom of God, uh, chapter one, verse three of Acts, that Jesus, again, has gathered his disciples to the uh, mountain. He's just to be taken up from, uh, uh, from their site. And Luke says that he presented himself in this period between uh, Easter and the Ascension. Now, 40 days later, he, uh, Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Uh, so Luke highlights that right at the very beginning. This is what Jesus was doing over this period of Easter, uh, displaying, proving, speaking about the kingdom of God. Now we see the very last verse in Acts also talks about the kingdom of God, that this is the, the evidence, the proof of, of God's kingdom, God's rule in the world. Acts 28, verse 31 uh, talks about Paul. It says that he lived there in, in Rome uh, for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Uh, so yeah, Paul again highlighted there as preaching, proclaiming the kingdom of God. So the very beginning, the very end, Acts is bookends, the kingdom of God, and then everything in the middle uh, is, is talking about how Jesus' rule is, is continuing to grow, continuing to expand, uh, to go forth in the world on the earth. Kingdom of God. The next one, uh, the church. The word most often used there in Greek is ekklesia, uh, which means called out. Uh, called out uh, is a, the literal breaking down. Ek is, is out and kaleo is calling. Uh, so being called out, most often it, it refers to a, a gathering or an assembly of, of people. That, that these are a select group of people called out, called together, uh, called to gather together. And that's really the, the sense that Acts has, uh, the ecclesia, the gathering of God's people. Uh, but, but it also kind of has a unique sense there as well. And that's why I included that, that phrase of being called out, that, that there's a gathering of people, but they're also called out. They're, they're also set apart for something unique, something different. They're set apart for spreading the message of the gospel as we've heard to be witnesses to uh, uh, to jesus to his life to his his death his resurrection and so acts looks at at the growth of this ecclesia the growth of the church uh, you know, most most closely in jerusalem over the first six chapters uh, but also as as paul goes forth and expands throughout the whole mediterranean uh, we see the growth of the church and that's where again like Marion was saying, that we can see that corresponding with Paul's letters uh, that he writes addressing to specific churches, uh, specific regions. Uh, and yeah, just that, that sense of the church growing, uh, the gathering of God's people, not, not remaining just small, but, but continuing to grow and, and what that looks like, kind of some of the struggles of the, the early church, as the people coming together, trying to figure out what church looks like, what, what church is supposed to be, what the gathering of God's people is supposed to be. Uh, kind of like what we've been doing maybe over these past couple of months here. Uh, we once knew and now we're, we're yeah, still figuring it out uh, a little bit in, in these slightly different times here. So church, an important emphasis, the gathering of God's people, their role, their mission, their ministry, what that looks like uh, throughout Acts. Uh, persecution plays a, a big role uh, in Acts uh, from the stoning of Stephen, who's the first recorded martyr of, of the church, uh, 
Saul is known, uh, if you've read Acts, he's known as kind of being bloodthirsty, relentless against the Christians initially, uh, seeking their demise, you know, trying to put them uh, in their place and, and really trying to eradicate them. But then throughout the rest of the book, uh, keeps popping up uh, persecution and and at the very least there's there's opposition to the gospel if, if not outright persecution there's opposition as as paul and others go to different cities different places to share about the gospel uh, more often than not they're met with opposition or or there's a small group of people that stir up a crowd and get them kicked out of, of the city or drive them out or or try to hush them or get them arrested or uh, you know all of these things so uh, persecution opposition to the to the gospel to the spread of the gospel uh, began right near the very beginning uh, uh, not long after Jesus and and even before that you know that's part of the reason Jesus was on the cross right you know, the opposition to the spread of the kingdom uh, and and still continues to this day this opposition of and, and against the, the power, the authority, the, the kingdom of God on the earth. That's really what the opposition is, not against any one individual necessarily, but what that individual stands for uh, as, as one under, under submission, under the rule, the reign of the lordship of Jesus, uh, first and foremost and primarily. And I think that's important for us to be considering and thinking about today, what that looks like, what are, how our lives are, are meant to reflect the, the lordship of Jesus and, and standing up perhaps in, in opposition or facing opposition to, to the values of the kingdom, uh, to what Jesus calls us to, uh, to a life of following him and that which the world offers or that which the world thinks is, is right or, or important. Right? Again, we've talked at length about this over the years, right? You know, that as, as the church and, and secular state and, and society continue to, to have increasingly divergent paths, uh, you know, this, this opposition to the lordship of Jesus will only increase. Because uh, again, the power of, of Jesus you know, is, is not welcomed or wanted uh, by the world in general, even though that's it has to move forward, continues to advance uh, in our midst. Next one, the advancing is the missions. We see that's a heavy theme, a, a very strong theme here in this book, uh, being sent out to other parts of the world. Again, primarily highlighted by Paul, his, his journeys around the Mediterranean, uh, the sea, that whole region there, uh, you know, but also there's also others that are sent out, uh, Barnabas and, and uh, Peter to a certain extent going out, uh, being sent out with, with the gospel there. And then Gentiles, we already talked about that, just all people outside of the Jewish, Jewish roots, outside of the Jewish faith there. Any questions on these themes or comments or things to follow up on or Maybe if you have your own thoughts of what's an important theme, if I left something off here, uh, kind of a, a good summary or an important point in this book. I think uh, probably the most important theme that is overarching throughout the whole entire book, and maybe it's not, um, it's not stated throughout the entire book, but verse eight, I think, is the overarching theme of the whole entire book but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and goes on to say. So I think it's that, <clears throat> that whole theme of receiving power and that's not just for the apostles, that's for us today. Um, when we give our lives to Christ, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can actually reach the world we can uh, become missionaries we can face persecution everything we do is by the power of christ working within us and it's not us and i think that that is what really sets us apart from every other um, religion in the world 
and that's why there's so much opposition because every other religion is going out in their own power and authority whereas we as christians are going out in the power and the authority of christ and that's where the to me that's where the 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 tension the conflict arises is because we are going out in christ's power and authority yeah and again and, and i think that's reflected right in in uh yeah it's easy to get focused i think with acts on you know this is what so and so did and so i need to to try to replicate that in my life or this is how my life is supposed to look or you know that sort of thing it's easy to get i uh, you know see paul as the example and this is what i have to live up to or this is what i have to do and that really i think you know like her, you're saying mary and this is the point of of the book really you know and this is the point of not only the book but the whole of christian faith that uh you know like you say it's not about us trying to replicate this or make our lives look like this or do this uh, but it's about the work of, of jesus in our lives you know going back to this idea of the kingdom of god the power the authority of, of jesus you know that's that's why that's really the primary theme one of the, the most important things in acts is is the the power of jesus the power of the holy spirit at work and in, in the disciples initially here but then as that spreads throughout the world the work of jesus uh, you know his power there uh you know moving in the face of opposition in the face of uh, I, you know people that haven't heard you know that the continuing moving forward and, and momentum the sense of, of momentum building i think uh you know with the, the power of of the holy spirit behind it all i uh, and that's why i've tried to shy away from uh, you know as much as it says sent as witnesses and we're talking about witnessing because i think that's so important here you know that's what jesus says the disciples are sent to do you're sent as my witnesses but it's in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? You know, it's in the power of my name. It's in the power of, of my kingdom that I'm sending you out. Uh, we've talked in, in the past too of, of being ambassadors, right? You know, being sent as uh, a, you know, an emissary from a foreign nation or a foreign, uh, you know, a dignitary. You, you go with their, with their might, with their authority, and you stand on their behalf. And, and really that's what, we do as as followers of jesus standing in his power and his authority and going going forth in that and so yeah we'll we'll touch on that and think more uh, next week in particular uh, as we we look at pentecost and and the, the initial outpouring of the holy spirit uh, but it that keeps popping up over and over again throughout the book you know the the work of the spirit the power of the spirit uh, uh, motivating changing people's minds and hearts and i uh, yeah, really being sent out again with that that word power and it keeps coming back to that the, the power of jesus going out in that power any other thoughts on these themes or anything else here couple other things I just wanted to touch on. Uh, some difficulties with reading this book. Uh, again, it's, like I said, it's a, a big book. Uh, it covers lots of material, lots of, lots of content there. Uh, one of the difficulties, I think, and, and we see that uh, over the past number of years within the, the church, especially in North America, is, is this book, I say, descriptive or prescriptive? Is this describing the what the church looked like, what the spread of the gospel looked like over the, the, the course of the first 30, 40, 50 years of the, the church? Or is it describing it, but also saying this is what the church is supposed to look like today? Uh, there's been a, a move as of late in the in North American church in particular that would look really at, at Acts chapter two, uh, toward the end of that chapter and say, this is this is the ideal church. This is what we need to get back to. The sense of you know we need to throw everything off in uh, Acts two forty two to forty seven. We'll look at that in a couple weeks time. 
you know, is this the ideal church that we need to, to replicate, that we need to do and, and try to get back to? Or is this a church that's still struggling, that's still trying to figure out what it means to be the gathering of God's people, you know, being called out and going forth? I, I tend to read it more as, as a descriptive, you know, this is what the, the Spirit was doing, what God was doing in his people at this time. We still go forth in that same power, but we also need to resist trying to go right back to this is how it was done, you know, 2,000 years ago. So we need to get back to that, I, you know, that we need to be doing X, Y, and Z, you know, in, in this particular form, in this particular shape. Because uh, the reality is our society is different, right? You know, if they were to write a book about us today, uh, you know, Trinity leader, they'd be talking about gathering together, maybe over Zoom, right? I, which, which is where we're at right now, at, at this point in our lives. Uh, is it something somebody a thousand years from now needs to go back to and, and try to replicate because it says right there? Maybe not, maybe. We'll see, we'll see where technology is and everything else, right? I, so, so we always, whenever we're reading a book, we always need to be mindful that it's written, first of all, you know, to a particular group, a particular time, uh, you know, a particular uh, people, but it also speaks to us still today. You know, that's the, the power of, of the living word, that it's not just stagnant or it's not just a, a book that, you know, we're, we're supposed to read, but that it, it still is alive, it's still active, and and that very same power that we just got done talking about is still the power of Jesus is still alive and active in our lives. Uh, so, yeah, I, and, and maybe you're not even aware of some of this, this movement or, or there's pockets of the church that would say, you know, we need to get back to this Acts, Acts 2, 42 to 47 uh, model and uh, share everything and live in common and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. We can have some political discussions there, Randy, if you want to at some point. Uh, economic realities and everything else here. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, we, we need to be mindful that it's still the same Holy Spirit leading, guiding the church moving forward. We still have the same mission, the same directive. Uh, but even as I've said, these, these past few months as we've journeyed, you know, the church looks different, but we're still supposed to be doing the same things. We're still on about the same things. Our, our focus still needs to be on making Jesus known, you know, just as, as it was at the beginning. I, yeah, so there's that. We can have more conversation on that uh, later if you want. I say another difficulty there is, is some of the repetition, especially as, as the book develops in the, the middle part of the book and a little bit later on, you get into lots of speeches, you know, Peter and Paul up before authorities or in a synagogue somewhere. And it's kind of the same old speech, uh, tailored just a little bit. Uh, it, and as you read through through Acts, I think it's tempting just to kind of, yeah, I've heard this before, and, and kind of skip over or move through. Uh, I say, don't discount what's being said. Uh, you know that the same old speech, which really is the story of Jesus, if you look at it, the story of how God was at work from the Old Testament times right through Jesus, uh, his life, his resurrection, his death, his resurrection. Uh, you know, that, that really is the, the central message. And that's why it gets repeated so often that, that Luke is, is really trying to drive home and emphasize that this is what we're bearing witness to. This is what Peter and Paul bear witness to. This is what the church today bears witness to. Uh, so, so, there's a sense of repetition, you know, the same old thing being said over and over again. But really, it's the same old thing you've heard me say week in and week out, too. Well, you know, it's and and for years and years, right? You know, this is the same old message that's still important, still valuable. You know, we can't discount it. Right? So don't get bogged down <laughs> necessarily or overwhelmed. Yeah, we've heard this before. Yeah, we've seen it before. Paul goes into the city, they get mad at him throw them out, uh, uh, kind of that, that repeated thing that happens over and over again. Um, I think really just trying to reinforce, uh, reemphasize the importance of value of, of the message in the face of opposition, in the face of everything else there. 
any comments on any of this? Nobody's wanting to jump in or cut me off here, so. Some of the blessings in the book. We'll wrap up pretty quick here okay, for just an hour or so. Uh, some of the blessings of the book is we've already highlighted and talked about the power of God, and the church growing in adversity, uh, and church grows in opposition, that, that we're reminded over and over again that, that the power of the gospel, the power of Jesus can't be stopped. Uh, we see that death didn't hold Jesus. The grave is empty. You know, the, the most powerful uh, picture that Jesus, that, that, that our God can't be defeated, that our God can't be stopped, and it's in that same power that the church grows, that the church goes, and, and still it's that same power that we as, as his followers live today. Uh, so we've talked about power already a lot, so I won't drag that out any further, but, but continuing to, to pay attention to that and be reminded this is the same same power that we live with that, that, that should shape our reality, uh, shape our lives, the power of the risen Jesus there. I, one of the other blessings I, you know, I, I take personally from this book is, is the growth of people. Uh, as much as I said, you know, we shouldn't get bogged down in, in just looking at this as, as maybe a biography, you know, following the life of Paul and, you know, seeing his life as one to emulate or, or one to model after. I, uh, you know, that's not the whole point of the book, but, but that's also a blessing in seeing how God uses somebody that was totally and utterly opposed to, to Christianity and to the faith and how in a split second, really, uh, the, the power of Jesus, the, the spirit reveals Jesus to him and his life is changed. Uh, but Acts then really kind of recounts the, his growth, uh, you know, over those years of, uh, you know, growing in, his faith and his relationship with his walk with Jesus. And, and so we see that as Acts follows the life of the church and the life of individuals, we see this, this growth in people, the spiritual growth as people live and walk with, with the word over a period of time. And then this challenge to us to be witnesses as well, I think is, is a blessing. Again, I've, said already too much of, on this but you know just how we are still sent to proclaim the same message the same message we're still sent to go into the world uh, this ever-expanding scope that you see behind me right you know going from from one place to the end of the world uh, and now that emphasis for us here at trinity right you know not just to stay in leader, that's important, but you know, also we're called to go out and go forth and be a blessing, bear witness throughout the world. So that's all I have. I've done far too much talking, like I said. I but wanted to get our feet wet just a little bit. I, some of the, the important things to be paying attention to in the book of Acts. Uh, yeah, like I often say, as we begin a book, it's helpful if you read through it from front to back, from cover to cover, uh, just so you get the, the the lay of the land, the scope of what we're talking about, what we're dealing with here. I would encourage you to do that. You can, there's lots of good audio Bibles, or there's a, one of the, the things that I've been using or, or offering as a resource during our midweek Bible study, looking at the minor prophets has been the videos that the Bible project do. Those are usually pretty good. Uh, nine or 10 minute videos, often of an overview of the book. I didn't actually look at Acts, whether, whether it's nine or 10 minutes or significantly longer than that, but yeah, they help you break down and, and kind of give you a good idea of what, what this book is all about. So I encourage you to make use of those resources. Uh, next week, we're going to look at, if there's any questions, I guess, or anything that we did want to touch on from Acts 1, you know, 1 to 11, uh, we can recap that next week. Uh, I'm skipping over Acts 1, 12 to 26. That's a, the choosing of, of an apostle to replace Judas, uh, how the disciples gathered together right after the ascension. 
and it shows how much Matthias became part of the 12 followers. We're not going to look at that uh, too much, much in depth, but you can read through that. And if you have questions, we'll maybe address that at Bible study. Uh, but our main text for next week, the Pentecost, is going to be Acts 1, or Acts 2, uh, 1 to 21. We'll look at that in Bible study and uh, worship together next week. And soon enough, it sounds like we might be back together. Uh, yeah, middle of Jan, middle of, I said middle of January. Hopefully it's not that long. <laughs> I've been so mixed up with months and days, but yeah, middle of June is, is the target date. We'll see the province announce that they have some guidelines for churches that they'll be handing down uh, as part of the phase three reopening on June 8th. Uh, so we'll see what that looks like and what that means and how we need to tailor ourselves. Uh, for that. So I uh, yeah, looking forward to maybe a few more in-person gatherings and worshiping together again. All right. Nobody really wants to unmute themselves today. I, well, I was I'll just going to say in-person might be good, but these are also really good. So, you know, like, yeah, it works like okay. It maybe was plan B, but it's not really a second best. So, you know, I, no, it works I'm, okay. I'm enjoying these. And I like the Bible project too, by the way. I haven't listened to every one, but I've listened to quite a few of them and they are really good. I like them. So, yeah, it's something a little different. You know, if you're a visual person, there's drawings, they're, yeah, they're, yeah they present it pretty well, I think, uh, you know, just in, in how they talk and how they, how they share. So, it's a uh, yeah. yeah really good good stuff so all right well that's going to be a wrap for today yeah, again if anything comes to mind over the week we'll recap lots next week i think uh, acts one and in a good chunk of acts two as well but thanks for joining this morning thank you We'll, yeah, we'll see you next week off to do worship or whatever your plan is for today. And I, Fill the yeah. coffee cup first and light the candles and then worship. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I did far too much talking. I still have half a cup of coffee here. So <laughs> that's my measure of Bible study, how, how good it's going. It's half a cup is not, not that good. So. <laughs> <laughs> John Mark, this is for us to regarding the uh, Bible project here in Access. What's that? I didn't hear that, sorry. I said regarding the Bible project, is there an app for that? It's on YouTube. So if you were just to go to YouTube and search Bible Project Acts or uh, that's usually all I do is the Bible Project and then whatever book. I think they probably have just about every book of the Bible done now. It's been a few years. I used to use that for, for confirmation and for other, other things. Uh, but they, they were making a, a big push to get the whole Bible done. So I think they're probably done with that. So yeah, if you just search for that on YouTube, I can provide a link to... I'll share this video and share this uh, PowerPoint that I had. And uh, yeah, I can provide a link for that as well. All right. Well, blessings on your day. We'll see you uh, back here next week. When we see you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing definitive anyway. <laughs>